I don't need to remind you that Magic Mike was a phenomenon. This movie was everywhere. A specimen of the Maconnaissance, sandwiched between the Jump Street movies. Being a boy in middle school, I was naturally in a sea of performative anti-Mikers, and I just never got around to watching it. But growing up in Tampa, and particularly attending film camps as a teenager, you naturally hear a lot of, oh, did you know they shot Magic Mike here? Which is to be expected when the only other films to compare it to are like, Dolphin Tale and Brian Cranston's The Infiltrator. I actually watched the 2004 Punisher movie in preparation for this video, particularly because it's the only other movie in history to be shot in Tampa and have Kevin Nash in it, but it was not a very illuminating experience. My point is, even though I didn't watch it for the longest time, I could never escape Magic Mike, and I grew a sort of kinship with the movie over the years. I had no idea what it was about, I had no idea what a sequel could warrant, but with Magic Mike's Last Dance on the Horizon, I finally had to indoctrinate myself. And to put it plainly, these movies fucking rock. As expected, this scored the Tampa points for me, and forgive me for the little Tampa preamble I'm about to give. For those who don't know, Florida doesn't really have tax incentives for film production, which a lot of states started offering around the late 90s, early 2000s. That's why so few shows and movies have shot in Florida since then, and that's why it was cheaper for Ben Affleck to build a fake Ebor city in Georgia than to actually shoot in Ebor for Live By Night, which was a whole local kerfuffle. Georgia offers up to 30% in tax credit, which is partly why Atlanta's become such a production hub now. Florida offers nothing. Miami's a bit of an exception because it's such a rich and iconic location. People accept the tax thing as just the cost of shooting there, and it pays off because people recognize and are drawn to Miami. No one's really hankering for Tampa, so no one really shoots there. However, there was a sweet spot for like two years following the recession where the state did introduce a similar program, and we got Dolphin Tail, we got Spring Breakers, we got Magic Mike, which is sort of the Bay Area trifecta of Clearwater, St. Petersburg, and Tampa proper. And then the program basically lost funding and died. Dolphin Tale, solid kids movie that's probably most notable for the tourism economy it brought to Clearwater. People really wanted to see that dolphin. Spring Breakers is obviously crazy and formally revolutionary, another 2012 relic. I actually watched it as a double feature with Magic Mike and felt my soul leave my body. And that one's also fun to point out St. Pete locations in but Magic Mike was a much more saccharine experience. The one thing that was illuminating about watching The Punisher was that it gave me an idea of an outsider's perspective of Tampa, a city no one's really forced to think about outside of the context of the only way we're getting John Travolta in our movie is if we shoot here. And it's funny to see it get treated as a regular movie city. Obviously there is a police department, but it's not like Tampa PD is something people refer to like NYPD or LAPD or even Miami PD. It doesn't have an identity like that. Downtown is like four city blocks, so it's hard to imagine any blockbuster level crime happening in this concrete jungle. And threats of getting thrown in the Tampa Bay, which colloquially is just called the Bay, feel like very surface level implementations of the local amenities. Like the extent of the research was reading Tampa's Wikipedia page or a travel brochure. And it's fun to see the city sort of play dress up here, but it also emphasizes some of the things that are the core essence of Tampa, if you will. Namely the Bay itself, the railroad, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, and Cubanos be it sandwiches or cigars. These things are all pretty easily gleanable from the history of the city or a quick look at a map. Henry B. Plant's presence, Ybor City's cigar industry, etc. The one staple that exists sort of outside this bubble is of course the strip clubs. Tampa is for some reason a very notable stripping town. I have not personally been inside any of the clubs myself, so maybe I haven't earned my stripes, but I'd drive by them all the time. If I were there right now, maybe I'd do some recon for the video, but here's a photo of me in front of the 2001 Odyssey Club for the sake of local credibility. Not only is this stripping presence documented in The Punisher, but also Tampa's most recent feature, Zola, who instead of Kevin Nash, shares Riley Keough with Magic Mike. But even Zola, which shot on location, is not very interested in the locale. Granted, it's a film about an outsider in Tampa, which is a happenstantial setting to begin with, and it leans into the hazy subjectivity of anecdote, so displaying the locale as is isn't exactly its mission. But all this is to attest to how refreshing it was to watch something as authentic and detailed as Magic Mike, which was so thoroughly processed through Channing Tatum's own stories and lived experience working as a stripper in Tampa. I'm honestly glad I didn't watch this movie sooner. Not only was I not really familiar with Steven Soderbergh's approach way back when, but growing up there, I think I was too close to the source. I only really started to get the appeal of the city when I'd come back from college and see it with outsiders eyes, 
like reading your own writing after years away from it. I don't live there anymore, and even though I go back a lot to visit my parents and friends, I can only appreciate it, again, from the outside in small doses. When I was back for COVID, after a few months I couldn't wait to leave again, so I have a very love-hate relationship with the city. But that magic mic filled me with nothing but Tampa patriotism is nothing short of a feat. This movie is very much about the strip scene, obviously. On paper, it's a very classic story of newcomer meets mentor who indoctrinates him in this hidden world. But what surprised me is how much of the movie takes place between the lines of that premise, how much is just about living in Tampa and basically just vibing between shows. It's not a particularly descript lifestyle, but if you know it, you recognize the small things. And the laid-backness of that nondescript quality is kind of the draw in the first place. That's why Soderbergh is key number one to this film working. He's the most laid-back filmmaker working today. This isn't some seedy underbelly we're watching. There's a crime element and fundamental exploitation, but the stakes are low and resolved without much escalation. Soderbergh doesn't take any measures to make this out to be more melodramatic than it is. His approach is very detached and seemingly objective, but it's still very intimate and humanist. These vignettes have a strong sense of melancholy about them, which despite being a fictional story in the present day, I think translates Tatum's real memories of his time there, and the idea that they can only ever be looked at as the past. And that resonated with my own personal sense of appreciation for the city from an inherent distance. But Mike, and by proxy Tatum's relationship with the city, is more than just nostalgia for these good times. It confronts the paradox of trying to get out of your life, but still making the most of it as it is, of trying to enjoy a temporary and exploitative situation, and in doing so, digging yourself deeper into it. Not far out from the recession, the gig economy plays a large role here. There's also just a wistful pining throughout every aspect of this movie. People pining for each other, pining for days of yore, pining for a better future. It's about corruption and betrayal and the commodification of relationships, really the commodification of everything. The strip club becomes the most direct and universal demonstration of selling your body through labor under the guise of temporariness. And even though the kings of Tampa make the most of their situation and form a brothership and have these great outings, they do all have hopes of leaving the business to pursue their passions and don't realize just how trapped in the system they are, or how much their work commandeers their sense of identity. Key number two to this movie working is that Mike is basically the salt of the earth, or at the very least, basically a good person, which makes this like an inverse red rocket. He's not entirely up his own ass with entrepreneurialism and has some self-awareness in comparison to McConaughey's Dallas. And where he's able to stay afloat through all the vices around him, Adam serves as a foil by being corrupted by the lifestyle. And even though Mike was his gateway and this corruption is a bit of a failure on his end, Adam clearly demonstrates some self-destructive tendencies from the start. Adam was gonna do whatever Adam wanted to do. And Mike himself only has noble intentions and mostly looks out for everyone's best interests, to his own detriment. He's surrounded by all these extremes that demonstrate the precarious balance he's managed to achieve in his own life, which can clearly tip over at any point if he doesn't find stronger footing elsewhere. And it arguably does, and he's too optimistic to realize it. Every scene where he talks hopefully about his furniture business has an inherent sadness because of how familiar we are with this of Mice and Men's story. And Soderbergh doesn't emphasize any of this plight of capitalism stuff. I Again, he keeps everything as casual as possible, and this is a deeply funny movie. But I think that's also in part because of how Mike compartmentalizes this stuff in his own head, with his grind-set mentality and believing the American myth. Everyone around him can see that he's a victim except for him, which culminates in a full-blown identity crisis. And this liminal existence between worlds he's living is externalized in his relationships with Olivia Munn and Cody Horn's characters, who are the backbone to everything congealing here. More than just a sweet, airy romance, which it is, Joanna represents the current world he's in, and Brooke represents the world he's after. His thing with Joanna, like his thing with stripping, was supposed to be a temporary affair, occasional hookups every now and then. And when it's clear he's starting to get too comfortable and dependent, he gets a wake-up call that informs his final decision to leave the business, which is also his decision to start an official romance with Brooke. This isn't an act of making it in the world and seeing your dreams come to fruition, but it's a leap of faith and an act of taking forward steps even without the promise of it working out. And Brooke and Joanna aren't just devices for Mike's personal growth. They're both independently stuck in similar life ruts, who essentially all reach catharsis alongside each other, which emphasizes the universal quality of Mike's story, and the sense that everyone's in the same boat and chasing the same dream. Not to get too screenwriter brain about this, but the way Mike's final decision in one fell swoop concludes the narrative, emotional, and philosophical stakes of the movie 
It's basically just what you're after as a screenwriter in the most conventional framework. And I think this movie's adherence to convention is a strength that allows the personality at the heart of the film to breathe. It can't be overstated, the balance Reed Carolyn achieves here, especially considering the Magic Mike movies are his only screenplay credits, aside from Dog, which he and Tatum co-directed. It's the kind of movie that's hard to discuss without just talking in circles, but that's because everything about the movie's form and execution speaks for itself, and every aspect elevates each other, from the thematic level to the sheer sensory experience of it. And how all of this so fundamentally utilizes Tampa in a way no other movie has before or since, yeah, it's an all-timer. Love the convenience of frozen dinners, but hate the, you know, the food? I know I sure do. And that's why I'm thankful that when I'm looking for a weeknight dinner in a pinch, I can turn to Factor to have my back. Owned by HelloFresh, you can have an even easier and quicker meal, with no prep time or cleanup. The food is ready in two minutes, easily disposable, and shipped in recyclable packaging. It's sure been a lifesaver for me. When I've made temporally unwise sponsor deals and have to put out both a 30-minute Magic Mike video and a comparison of the Cronenbergs within a week of each other, Spoiler for the next video. I don't have time to compile a grocery list and run to the store and cook meals and wash my dishes. With Factor, I don't have to. And I can still enjoy a fresh, never frozen, flavor-packed meal at a moment's notice. And with endless customizability, Factor can cater to any diet type with its keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and protein plus options. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code TaylorJWilliams50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. This movie is just as much of a miracle as the first one, even though it has so few of the aspects that form the first one's identity. Again, that tax program died pretty quickly, so this time around they're cheating Georgia for Florida. They fully lean into the premise as a vehicle for full-on strip routines like it's a golden age musical instead of existing between the lines of performance. And basically every lead character in the first one except for Mike himself is absent from this movie. And in the wake of these things missing, it's revealed just how much potency everything that was on the back burner in the first one has when brought to the forefront here. None of these changes contradicts what worked about the first one, specifically because of the paradigm shift that's taken place between movies. The first one is all about work-life balance, and how this job that consists of fun performance becomes parasitic, drawing us into each performance and then hard cutting out of it midway through into the next scene to translate that mental separation. This time around, stripping is no longer a job, so all that remains is the love of the craft, which the film lovingly revels in through routines that, as the XXL suggests, are bigger and better than ever. I mean, seriously, the difference in choreography between these movies is astounding. The routines are fun in the first one, and we get the appeal of them in-world, but the scale and fluidity and conceptualization here are so much more impressive and, more importantly, expressive. One of the most confounding aspects of this movie is that Soderbergh is no longer directing, but still serving as DP and editor, which, as far as I know, is the only time he's ever done this. It's worth noting that at this point in his career, he had retired from directing out of frustration with the lack of agency producers give directors, which feels applicable to Mike having gotten out of the stripping game for similar lack of agency. In Soderbergh's place is Gregory Jacobs, a protege of his who served as his go-to assistant director on most of his films, including the first Magic Mike, who prior had only directed a low-key thriller in 2007 that Soderbergh helped finance in the first place. I don't want to diminish Jacobs's contribution to this movie, but considering all these factors, and the world and rhythmic vibe Soderbergh and Tatum created in the first one that's carried over here, here, and the fact that Soderbergh is such a dicey guy when it comes to crediting himself in general, often resorting to pseudonyms, it's sort of popularly accepted that Soderbergh ghost-directed this movie, with Jacobs in the director's chair for more logistical management. There's certainly irony in this, considering the movie's and Soderbergh's own anti-producer control rhetoric in valuing the job of the worker or the director. So again, maybe it's a little remiss to say ghost-directed, and maybe Jacobs had more agency. But if all Soderbergh did was produce and shoot and edit and heavily advise Jacobs, then I think it's still safe to call this a Soderbergh film. And it makes sense then that the movie, while maintaining the weightlessness of the first one, finds its currency in lingering set pieces that find much more creative uses of lighting and blocking than the first one. For the record, I think that movie looks great too, and Soderbergh, or should I say Peter Andrews, dialing his signature yellow-white balance to the max fits the presentation of Tampa and the sense of real-time nostalgia. But in XXL, he goes for much bigger swings, and at times it's hard to believe that a movie that still ultimately feels this casual and down-to-earth 
is able to be so expressive with the camera. So many scenes where subjects are just barely outlined by headlights in the dark. The backdrop of sand ripples lit almost completely from the side is an image that's gonna live in my mind forever. Oscillating party lights, old school gas lamps, and what might be the single most euphoric moment in an American movie in the last decade. So much of what I love about this movie comes from things that strike me as the platonic ideal of a sequel. Upping the ante without diminishing the smaller scale of the first movie, preserving the same sense of voice, finding new things to explore that are still present and established in the first one, and taking measures to cement certain things as franchise staples, for lack of a less corporate term. Things that form the identity of the series. The way this movie takes the pony scene from the first one, which is probably the most iconic scene in that movie, but doesn't call particular attention to itself in the moment, and effectively turns it into the theme song of the franchise, is something that could very easily serve the sole purpose of self-mythology, but as employed here, only becomes richer and more complex. In the inciting incident. After Mike has effectively turned down the offer to go to Myrtle Beach, the song comes on for the first time since that scene in the first one. And with steam and sparks rising from the sand belt, Mike becomes a phoenix rising from the ashes. As he slowly looks up, his mask becomes a blank Kuleshavian canvas for us to project the information we know about his character and the visual information in the scene onto to understand exactly what he's feeling without getting any sort of facial indication. To me, that's what the movies are all about. This is the kind of epic grandiosity you'd find them going for in a fucking Batman movie. And of course, they immediately brush it off in a return to the casual framework that now has this heightened ethos, which then breaks out into the movie's first dance routine, which also establishes the scale we're working with here, and the inherent difference between dancing for work and dancing for pleasure. This effectively turns Pony from an ode cementing Mike as a beast of burden into an anthem of his transcendence and evolution. I've watched this scene on its own maybe a hundred times, and I only get stronger chills from it every time. I think the reason this moment feels so triumphant lies in how the movie subverts the assumed triumph of the first one. After the decisive leap of faith Mike takes at the end of that one, he has become a beast of burden yet again. He's achieved, for all intents and purposes, the American dream. He's done it. He's got his furniture business, which he runs with more consideration for his workers than Dallas had for him, and he's with Brooke, fulfilling the promise of the first movie. But his problems aren't solved, and the sense of regular everyday melancholy remains. Not only do we eventually learn that Brooke is leaving him, but having left the stripping world behind him, he's turned what was previously his escape from work into work itself. Like stripping, he has a passion and a knack for carpentry but now it's purely a job, and it's all he has left. He's carrying people's loads, and he's defined by his work again. This scene, and his decision to join the fellas on their road trip, not only kickstarts the movie on a strictly narrative level, but it serves as another rejection of where he's at in life, rising above the pitfalls of a breakup, and the philosophical position he's been put back in by his work. To me, this serves as a mirror image of the first movie, concluding all its stakes in the climax. Now the decisive moment is the inciting incident, and the rest of the movie is essentially an episode joyride. And through small pockets of tension, the externally low stakes threat of, oh no, will we get to the convention in time, becomes an excuse to revel in all the fringe aspects of the world of the first movie. With pretty much every other character from the first one gone, the other kings of Tampa finally take precedence. In the first movie, they function essentially as a Greek chorus whose main purpose is to collectively externalize status quo. But here, they're each given an individual identity with their own unique relationships with Mike and their own narrative setups and payoffs. Each left with the remnants of Dallas that they have to break out of to embrace their passions through personalized routines. It's kind of funny to see the singular traits they're each given in the first one extrapolated here into full characters. I'm not putting that out there, man. There's too much You're anger. You're not putting what out there. That negative energy. You have so much anger, man, and it is all in your heart chakra. Uh, I get the fire phobia issue. Uh, I got the phobia. Thing. You have a fire phobia. But this was already a cast waiting for more to chew on, and their overall charisma leaves nothing really to be desired. Amber Heard is brought in as the new love interest, and she admittedly very much feels like a surrogate Brooke. Maybe Mike just has a type. For the record, I liked Brooke and Cody Horn. I think her stern, down-to-earth attitude and unamusedness brought a sense of foil and dimension to the debauchery that was refreshing. And watching her watch Mike during the pony scene with a more or less flat expression shows so much repression trying to break out of the wall she's put up around herself, not dissimilar to the welding mask Mike wears in XXL's pony scene. But Zoe's incorporated into this movie just enough to give a semblance of throughline and narrative arc, while again letting the set pieces breathe and speak for themselves. Even though so much of this movie is a mirror image of the first one, the core themes are the same. And now the entrepreneurial spirit becomes even more universal, present in every 
performer. Everyone has some iron in the fire, shooting entirely into the dark, giving endlessly to a system that can and likely will arbitrarily spit them out. This array of characters gives us a more holistic spectrum of different stages along the way of chasing the American dream, from shooting in the dark to having made it and still being unfulfilled. So even though the physical stakes of getting to the convention are low and require little dramatic decision making, the very act of making it there and performing are of utmost philosophical importance, an assertion of one's passion amid the monotony of life. That even though changing the system is nearly impossible, at least within these characters' lifetimes, and simply submitting and living within it can be soul-crushing, the good moments are fleeting, but they make life worth living. These movies make no mission of explicitly reckoning with systemic issues, as they're purely locked in on these characters' perspectives on the ground level. But taking this approach and ending on these moments of clarity amid the monotony is what makes the Magic Mike franchise life-affirming cinema. And aside from the philosophical reading, which I should stress is very deeply baked into the film, but not at all what it's primarily interested in accentuating, even though it's there if you choose to read into it, this movie is just a victory lap in every sense of the word. Its real currency is those next level set pieces, which themselves are part of the one last ride setup of the film. And even though, again, this is not directed by Soderbergh, we still get a small sense of greatest hits from him every now and then. From Andy McDowell returning to a Soderbergh film for the first time since his debut Sex, Lies, and Videotape, to the final sequence hearkening back to the days of Ocean's Eleven. It would be two years before Soderbergh came out of retirement with Logan Lucky, which would be a normal latent period between movies if it were literally really anyone else, but one can't help but see this greatest hits effort as the same kind of reminder of the passion for the craft that had become corrupted by superiors as Mike himself listening to Pony in the shop and being reminded of his passion. The movie itself is this transcendent dance of Soderbergh's that got him back into the life, notably ending with yet another iteration of the revelatory song, which at this point has come to take on so much conflicting meaning. This movie does so much work flipping and elevating the thematic material while being such a transcendent experience in and of itself the two movies have untouchably sat as a satisfying duology for eight years. But now that Soderbergh is settled into his post-retirement era, he's set on re-entering this world properly from the director's seat once again. I'm just a bachelor I'm looking for a partner I should mention, because it's crucial to the existence of this movie, that the world has not been without Magic Mike Media since the release of the second movie. And since then, the franchise has been surviving off of Magic Mike Live. It's basically a cabaret-type show that applies the choreography of the stripping world to the scale of the theater, and it features a lot of the same creative talent as the movies. Tatum directed the show and conceived it with Carolyn, Allison Falk choreographed the show, I'm sure Soderbergh threw some money at it. It even spawned a reality competition series called Finding Magic Mike, where dancers competed to be in Magic Mike Live. Legend has it that Soderbergh watched the live show and had a light bulb moment where it suddenly clicked how he could do a third Magic Mike installment. And if you can imagine it, he went on to make a movie where Channing Tatum directs a live Magic Mike show. If XXL is a victory lap, then Magic Mike's last dance is a cooldown. And if you thought the second one abandoned a lot of things that made up the identity of the first one, then you won't even recognize this movie. The gang is gone, aside from a Zoom cameo, as well as any sense of debauchery. The movie primarily takes takes place in London and starts out in Miami, which is to say no Tampa or even fake Tampa, and bizarrely we're guided by a narrator unlike the other movies, just to name a couple of formal decisions off the top of my head. I'm not gonna act like it doesn't feel wrong to have a movie that doesn't revel in its locations like the first two do, mainly taking place indoors, but I get it. Soderbergh is kind of a shark. He's always moving forward, and it makes sense that for a movie returning to an old flame, he's unconcerned about weighing himself down with series tropes. Decisions to switch up the language, like the narration thing, are exciting, and the way this movie unceremoniously throws in Pony for like two seconds out of Been There Done That Obligation is probably the moment most emblematic of this mentality. I also think leaving the gang out this time around preserves a sense of consequence and finality to XXL. That even though this is Magic Mike's last dance, that was still one last ride to a certain extent. So naturally, most of these changes reflect the themes of growing up and evolving, which makes sense for a return eight years later, well past the momentum of the first two. And despite lacking in a lot of the branding, it still maintains the core sentiment of the series, the everyday melancholy and perseverance in the face of failed dreams. Dreams. The changes also, maybe more importantly, reflect COVID shooting. But with Kimmy last year, Soderbergh proved that he's not afraid of leaning into COVID as our reality. And he's one of the few filmmakers who's been able to navigate it with any sort of tact 
fucked. In this movie, it's a little comical how down on his luck Mike's gotten, which COVID explicitly plays a part in. But all these factors, including the lack of lived-in locale, are only embellishing the sense of isolation that's been there the whole series. And within that isolation, Soderbergh finds a stronger sense of intimacy. The visual language reflects this by fully flipping from the first movie's yellow look to entirely blue exteriors, in contrast with tungsten interiors, the warmth to be had inside seeking shelter from the elements. This is the only movie in the trilogy that can, and actually is, classified as a proper romance. The romance subplots in the first movie are ingredients in a larger soup that illustrates Mike as the beast of burden. In XXL, it's very much on the periphery. It honestly feels like it's mostly there for pacing reasons, as fun and welcome as it is. This time around, everything else, including a familiar indictment of studio bureaucracy and agency and corruption of craft, seems primarily in service of progressing Mike's relationship with Salma Hayek's Max, rather than the relationship informing other things. You could call it a betrayal, choosing not to make those things the rhetorical target, but I think the series has more than set its piece by now. And I think part of the sense of growing up that the movie's exploring is asserting the importance of connection above all else. For the first time, rather than labor like the first one or passion like the second one, the dancing serves purely as a language of desire. The first act, in which Mike and Max essentially have their meet cute, not only culminates in the movie's best scene, but also one of the best dances of the series. Starting with a one as we casually transition from setup into the dance itself, Soderbergh subdues the acrobatic and sensual choreography with crossfades into other coverage of the scene maintaining continuity, which gives the whole thing a hypnotic quality. And as the song continues in supposed real time, we get a hard cut and clearly like 30 minutes have passed. And I know this is hard to visualize if you haven't seen it, and I don't have footage because it's still in theaters, but that cut is one of the most erotic moments I've seen in any recent movie. The scene already has so many great moments of slow burn tension leading up to the dance, subtle one-liners and blocking, and the pure ecstasy on Salma Hayek's face throughout the whole sequence is explosive. But that cut really did it for me. And frankly, this scene made me feel like Soderbergh still has some of the sex lies and videotape juice. What I love about that movie is the idea of proxy sex still being sex. It's not like the Tom Jones dinner scene or any Hayes Code era film where something in the abstract is used to communicate sex. It's essentially doing that, but with something that is still, from a disconnected place, sex. Something about that concept just strikes me as paradoxical and so heavy-handed it absolves its own heavy-handedness. In that movie, it's the video tapes discussing sex, and in this movie it's pantomiming sex positions. It's so overt, they might as well be having sex, but that barrier makes it even more potent than a literal sex scene, which is why Soderbergh cuts straight from this act of passion to their post-coital positioning. I suppose this idea of stripping as overt proxy sex is literally just the conceit of stripping in the first place, so it certainly informs the other movies. But this is the first time it's been used solely for that purpose, and it feels liberating. So this is now two Magic Mike movies that have their best scene near the beginning of the movie. And unfortunately, Magic Mike's Last Dance doesn't quite break off into the constant state of transcendence that XXL achieves. What we get after this scene is a plot about Mike putting on this show for Max in London to get back at her soon-to-be ex-husband, filled with comedies of manners and Mike as a fish out of water, which as goofy and perhaps trite as they are, are grounded by Tatum assuming the expected charisma of the character without missing a beat after all these years, and cranking the himbo meter up like we've never seen. There's some business about Max's husband trying to shut down the show, they have to seduce a government official, and this is all fun stuff, if a bit light. The best moments from here on out are the sort of will-they-won't-they they between Max and Mike, and the romantic rivalry of it all. Scenes where they're rehearsing for the show, and performers practicing on Max, or Mike practicing Practicing on other performers makes each other jealous and ratchets up that tension. But a lot of this movie is allocated to recruiting the performers for the show, and the show itself as performed by them. And there's not nearly as much potency in their performance as the leads, or in the random characters we're introduced to in XXL, since these guys are established in montage and don't really get any room to breathe. Even their coverage in the show is pretty inert compared to the fluid camera moves Mike gets in his two big dances, which I'd think is the point if the film weren't so intent on reveling in these other performances and textually should. I appreciate what Soderbergh's going for by indulging so much in the show for the climax of the movie. He's a very inventive man and always looking for new places for the medium to go, and this seems like an opportunity to bridge mediums and assert the standalone power of live performance, which is actually another thing that structurally reminded me of Sex, Lies, and Videotape. In that movie, where the climax has already taken place off screen and we only experience it through John experiencing it on the tape, here the climax has effectively already taken place in that Mike has already off-screen choreographed 
choreographed and planned out this show to proclaim his love for Max and save the theater from ruin, and we experience it through the performance. It's not one-to-one, -one, but compared to XXL where we watch the training montage, it's close enough that it got me thinking about it. The show does contain a joke where the MC grabs a microphone and calls it a magic mic, and I'm half convinced that that's the million dollar idea Soderbergh had that inspired this movie. I'll be so pissed off if I find out that that was lifted from the live show. It doesn't help that the climax does kind of feel like I'm just watching Magic Mike live. But even divorcing the meta from my mind, and not reducing this to a reskinning of the franchise's current cash cow, there's a lot that feels like dead air here, if not straight up redundant when compared to XXL. Still, there's a lot that's sweet about this movie, and if nothing else, it's the latest in a string of relatively soft swings from Soderbergh, that are mostly pretty good. On paper, that sounds like the worst thing a movie can be, that a strong swing and miss would be more respectable, but even in soft swing mode, Soderbergh is still able to find new and inventive things to do with the camera. <laughs> Much like Soderbergh's inability to stay out of the game for very long, what we have in the Magic Mike trilogy is one movie where our hero leaves the business, effectively having his last ride, followed by two more One Last Ride movies. I wouldn't be surprised if we get another one of these in 10 years, with Mike single again and down on his luck again. Maybe as time goes by it gets less and less likely, and with the middling qualities of Mike's last dance, Soderbergh has perhaps exhausted his reboot mileage for the franchise at least in the form of narrative feature film. Maybe one day he'll cave to Alex Pettifer's persistent requests and do a spin-off series about the kid. Though artistic bankruptcy aside, I think as a matter of principle, Soderbergh will hold fast. I think this does sort of follow a classic trilogy trajectory, peaking with the second movie and fizzling out a bit with the third. But I love one and two for very different reasons. More personal reasons for one. And though three pales in comparison, it's far from a sinker. Not only does it not diminish what's incredible about the first two, but it's also just a solid movie. The audience at my screening was very vocal throughout, which I think the sound mixing of the audience in the final performance provoked a little bit. But even in that first dance scene, the seductive one-liners leading up to it were getting crazy audience reactions. And actually I missed the first like two minutes of the movie, so afterward I went back in just to catch the opening. And staying again through that first dance, it actually did feel less electric without people responding to it. So maybe it succeeded in channeling the power of live performance. Or maybe that's just the beauty of the communal experience of watching a movie in a theater. I do hope Soderbergh has a couple more movies with real gravitas left in him, but for someone firing at the rate he's going, he's got a pretty good hit rate. And more importantly, if this mode of production is how he's able to maintain the passion for its own sake rather than producer or audience demands, then he's been telegraphing this for the whole series. And to that I say good for him. This has been the Magic Mike Trilogy. As always, I want to know your thoughts. Links are in the description. Thanks for watching, and goodbye. <laughs> Uh, 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 uh.